Hi everyone, uh, welcome to um, this next lecture of BBRD or um, QIBE. Um, today we're going to look at the last section of Unit 2. So we're going to look at uh, cost planning and in particular we're going to look at Chapter 6 of the study notes. So um, uh, we're going to look at cost planning and how the how it influences uh, the decisions that's made and how the contract actually has uh, influence on um, on the cost of the project and the execution of the project. So um, as an introduction is historically um, projects are usually known of uh, the challenges and cost overruns and so on and hence um, there's a bit of an aggression or frustration when uh, ever um, the construction industry is is looked at so the main objective is to do proper planning and to have proper and accurate information available the main thing is not um, to keep any information away from from your client uh, whenever you're doing your um, estimations and so on and it is um, a known fact that there will be unknowns on on your project so the main thing is uh, whenever you do uh, cost um, evaluation cost control etc is to take that in into account and to anticipate it um, and not to be um, don't um, and that you don't um, fall into the trap of trying to impress your client and trying to fit everything into the budget you have to be objective and realistic about how you approach it okay so cost control can only be effective if it's implemented properly from the early stages of the project okay again that example of uh, keeping the building smaller will keep the cost lower um, and the design shape that we will still get into in the module um, all of those perimeters, the finishes that we're going to look at, um, the type of construction, uh, the earthworks, etc. Um, that has to be controlled as far as possible. So the project manager, in conjunction with the client, must determine the project um, or the type of cost control required um, to the extent of his responsibility uh, as project manager. So um, things like who's are going to be appointed the land surveyor is it uh, um, necessary for civil engineer is it necessary for structural engineer etc etc um, and those perimeters so the project manager will go through uh, these elements with the client um, what type of contract um, does the client want and then um, forced to make future projections based on very little information this is a very um, difficult thing always to mitigate especially as a qs on a project as a qs uh, usually you are under pressure to to produce cost estimates and you don't really have the information available and unfortunately um, most of the early estimations are dependent on your experience um, on working on previous projects um, like for instance we had a client um, here in Bloemfontein where we used to add uh, quite a lot of contingencies um, to allow for this specific client because this client used to like to add items as um, as one progressed so um, we had to think a little bit ahead of things and kind whenever we had the design meetings ask all the different questions of what the client would like to be added to this project so um, you really have to anticipate and get the proper scope from uh, from your client okay and it's expected um, that cost doesn't always allow for the unforeseen amounts such as design development costs resource costs financing costs etc payment of the professional fees and so on so um, many times especially in home builders where the clients usually aren't that educated on on the costs that uh, will be incurred on the project it is important to paint the entire picture for them because they will uh, they might have a budget in mind um, based on a rate per square meter and uh, that rate per square meter doesn't necessarily account for the submission to the municipality for uh, approval of the drawings the appointment of the arctic the appointment of the structural engineer etc etc 
So looking at budget, stipulation and control uh, budget, max amount of um, money the client is willing to spend to justify it financially. Okay, so that is basically what funds do the client, what does he have available. Uh, if you're working with um, home builders, it's usually the uh, loan amount that they can obtain. Uh, if you're working with um, uh, state organizations, um, usually there is a budget allocation each year in the financial year. This is the amount of budget that's available for this project and it has been allocated and it's ring fenced. Um, so that uh, funds is basically the budget that you can work with uh, on the project. It uh, also just take note um, is with um, public enterprises, usually the fees and the construction cost is usually two separate budgets. So just make sure uh, when uh, when you do get involved with it that you understand how the budget allocation actually works. Um, in, uh, sometimes on, uh, for instance, on the mines, we uh, also experience that um, there's certain capital allocations for within a financial year for certain sections, and it, uh, the project has to be completed up to that stage. So, uh, very important to acquaint yourself with how the budgets are allocated towards the project. And there might be operation maintenance um, budgets that, that one can use for furniture and fittings to the building later on and so on. So it's, it's um, uh, which might not necessarily form part of the construction cost. So just acquaint yourself with how um, that budget allocations works and exactly what can be used uh, uh, of those budgets on a specific area of, of the project. Okay, so it's um, you have to prepare projections for budgets, um, and it's very difficult uh, for the project manager usually to do that. Um, for instance, if you get into the construction, but that's where the uh, quantity surveyor usually advises the project manager on how the um, certain cost elements fits together. But the project manager um, has the obligation to look at the um, whole picture. Um, whenever looking at budget allocations. Okay, and then the preparation and projections is uh, important to all the parties and it influences all aspects of the development. Every phase needs to be in budget for the next phase to continue. So the main thing is once you've done with um, stage one and two, um, you have to make sure that there's uh, um, enough budget available before the rest of the design continues. Um, so that it is fixed at that stage bef before it continues. Then um, project budget starts with stipulating the client's needs and all the direct um, uh, that are directly related to the extent of the project. And that's what I've already spoken about um, earlier on. And then the project manager plays an important role in early stages of development, getting the scope um, available uh, and he kind of acts like a mediator in testing, scrutinizing and identifying the variables that relate to the project. Getting the scope is key in this aspect. Okay, so continuing with the budget control, the budget uh, represents the contract tender amount divided between the number of different uh, work groups. So. Um, the work groups that I've spoken about is basically just the different sections of the project who um, and then the work groups is um, explained further. So the contractor should be should have a budget uh, works program for the project. So for the different sections of the project, um, he should have different um, budgets allocated to it. Okay, so the client budget represents the time schedule of payments and the availability of funds. So, um, as mentioned earlier, clients might have financial years that they have to do a certain amount of spending. So, a cash flow is very important uh, for uh, for this. So, uh, we'll have a look at um, just the entry level of of budgets uh, and cash flow that we're going to look at. So, I've just inserted a short break. Uh, here as well so uh, you can have a look at the youtube video uh, online as well as again the b1m channel 
uh, that I copied in here and it's just a short little video on the BIM and 5D um, uh, BIM so uh, quite an interesting introduction just to 5D BIM it might explain how um, things are uh, done whenever working on a model in a BIM environment within a BIM environment so uh, please have a look at it it's um, it's not part of the module but it uh, will give you some background of how everything fits into each other and what BIM is and um, what we're working towards and uh, how things are developing in in the industry so getting to financial reporting and the cash flow you will see that we've got a short um, or very simple s curve um, that we've drawn here um, in the fourth year with the construction project managers uh, we do uh, quite an extensive um, operation of cash flows and the possibilities of uh, creating your uh, cash flow based on your program the qss does this as well with um, construction finance and also in project management it's done and dealt with uh, quite extensively so um, uh, this is just a very basic uh, s curve and if if you have a look at it, it um, the project expenditure usually starts out slowly and it picks up speed and then it slows down yeah at the end this is how it usually works on on site so it depends um, if a contractor is efficient in his implementation usually this is how the cash flow uh, cash flow would look so the project manager um, manager is obliged uh, to advise uh, the client on the project management or the project manager of any unforeseen costs arising on uh, as the project um, develops and uh, the client scheduling of cash flow um, is very important as mentioned he has to know when he's going to actually spend when is this money going to flow out of his account um, very important he has to make sure that he has the available funds to actually pay the contractor when needed so in short um, cash flow is basically just your cost of the project connected with your uh, time so the project manager must compile a cash flow indicating the expected program and activities on a large and complex projects okay so you can imagine as as the projects become more complex they will have to know um, when large funds will be um, will be paid out because it will not necessarily be a nice linear construction process there might be different sections of the project that will start at different times of of the project life cycle and thus the cash flow is very important for that and then the project planning should take into account the total lump sum and the timing of the project this is what i basically just mentioned here and then from that your cash flow is projected or uh, created okay so economic viability studies very important uh, as we progress through the different project life cycles is the project must be economical uh, viable okay so um, it doesn't help that you construct a project uh, that will not be able to pay itself or be paid for so very important for that and then the methods to determine viabilities uh, depending on private or public sectors is usually um, the cost benefit relation uh, this is now um, for public enterprises usually uh, will you be able to uh, recover the capital um, is there repayment periods that, he, that you have to look at and what is the yield rate what will the actual income be for this project so this is the different um, viability studies that you might have to look at the cost benefit so community projects in the private sector um, it might, might not necessarily be to make a profit but you will um, have to make sure that you can actually um, get all the funds together to actually construct um, this community hall or this church or so capital recovery goes hand in hand with the one above um, is if uh, you took out a loan um, from the bank will you actually get the capital to repay that loan 
and then if you've got repayment periods how long will it take to actually repay this uh, project if you're selling houses uh, or renting uh, the facility out how long will it take for you to actually get enough income to repay the loan that you've taken out okay and then obviously you have to look at your re um, yield will you make a profit if you um, if this project is um, earmarked to make a profit okay so each method uses the fundamental Co uh, comparisons of time money of value or uh, time value uh, of money so um, money today might not necessarily be this is, uh, the value of money today will not be the same in the future because of inflation uh, additional cost that has to be incurred in just the upkeep of the project uh, or the building or so so very important to take note of this Okay, so the levels of accuracy, so degree of plus or minus should be applied to the projects. So usually when you start out with a project, you, you allow for accuracy of say 20% of your estimates because there's still a lot of unknowns. And then when, when you get into the construction, you go down to 5% or 2% uh, depending on the accuracy or the uh, knowns and the unknowns of the project. Okay, there are two types of projections for building projects. You have your estimated projections, also called preliminary or conceptual budgets. Okay, then you've got your detailed projections, uh, also called the final definite contract or can contractors projections. So uh, if you get into your bills of quantities where you've got detailed estimations, usually that um, those amounts do, do not change too much. Okay, so the level of accuracy on the preliminary projections can vary considerably okay so depending on uh, the accuracy so um, in in the study notes um, they talk about 40 percent to minus 40 percent before design is completed this is quite high usually in industry we try to stick to not 20 percent sometimes the client can actually stipulate to you you have to be accurate to this um, this degree so it just means that you have to spend more time in finding out exactly what um, all the perimeters might be uh, and allowing some additional um, contingencies in your estimations and then after the design is done it might go down uh, from 25 to minus 10 percent of the estimation and then when you get into your detailed measurements it will go down to 10 to 5 percent okay um, it is very important to try and be as accurate as possible no matter what stage of the development um, it's always um, very important to um, also justify and be very methodical when you do do your estimations um, to uh, make sure that you've got all of the information uh, available when you do your estimation okay the types of contracts and on on buildings and this does have an influence on the cost of the project so the system of obtaining contracts are critical for the success of your project okay so um, uh, the most important aspects uh, for the clients are usually uh, quality value cost time and then the assurance that it will be that this project will actually get done uh, there will be enough funds to actually construct this building uh, etc so um, it's critical to um, to know what type of contract you're going to go into um, and we'll elaborate on that a little bit more just now then the project manager should have a good idea of what type of contract will be uh, suitable for each type of contract. So um, it really depends on on the client. If he if the client wants to go out on in construction as soon as possible, then uh, a, diff a, a different uh, contract might be applicable. Um, a design and build might be uh, more conducive to a project like this instead of a design being completed first and then going out on tender. Okay, the shorter time between the inception and the completion, the greater need for less for a less rigid approach. So um, if there's not a, um, a lot of time um, for the client to get the project done, usually he will pay a higher premium and but you will go out on tender much quicker so if the client wants to go out on 
um, build a house uh, quicker, he will um, approach a contractor or um, approach a construction project manager uh, and he might enter into a, a um, contract, uh, managing contract uh, with that party uh, who will then um, provide a um, estimate or a cost, a quote uh, based on that and then allowing for the design and the um, all of the other uh, items that still need to take place before the actual construction can start. So, um, yes, the, uh, the less rigid it becomes, the quicker the client wants to get the project um, um, going. Okay, and then there's a wide variety of methods available uh, and um, you have to advise the client on which route is the best route to take. Okay, so the type of contracts and obtaining your contracts. So any amendments should be discussed with a legal advisor or expert uh, to ensure the amendments that have been made in the contract actually cause the desired change and not create le legal loopholes. So it's very important to, to make sure of the contract that you choose. Um, usually the QSs are in a good position to give advice, um, but when it comes to the actual clauses and so on, I, one would actually like to try and stick as close as possible to the standard contracts and uh, if there's a uh, bespoke uh, contract which is usually contracts that's drawn up or mended consider considerably uh, usually a specialist legal advisor uh, would be obtained for that okay and it's important to select a method of obtaining your contract because it ensures the success of the contract how are you going to go out on tender or are you going to ask for quotes? Are you going to get the design completed and then this contract might be more useful on, on this project? So all types of contracts have advantages and disadvantages, which the project manager must be fully aware of. Okay. The experience of the project team uh, with different types of contracts can be a great value and should be utilized fully. So usually uh, we've got um, four standard contracts in south africa um, the engineers likes to use the fitty contract for instance or the gcc contract whereas in the building environment the architects and the qss are usually more um, familiar with the jbcc contract um, and now with the nec contract also um, many engineers especially on escom projects um, like to use the NEC contract uh, and although um, the experience levels uh, in the industry in South Africa the NEC hasn't been used that often but it really depends on um, it, it boils down to um, the experience on on the contracts of the parties okay two types of contracts usually um, we have two types of contracts so you've got price in advance so this is usually the ones that that we uh, promulgate and it's um, the contracts with quantities provisional and basic quantities you've got lump sum contracts uh, with schedules of rates usually um, and then you've got your scheduled tra rates negotiate contracts and then you've got comprehensive um, measurements this is um, uh, non remeasurable BOQs where the design and everything is available before you go out on tender and um, you've got extensive quantities measured and then you've got your turnkey contracts where um, a contractor or a, um, a substantial amount of the design still needs to take place and um, then the contracting party still um, is still responsible for a large section of the design of the project and then you've got cost remu uh, re remuneration types which is your cost plus so you would um, appoint a contractor for instance he, um, he's not appointed on a fixed amount uh, there's no cap on the um, amount provided but it is arranged that this uh, this contractor might have a certain markup on the material and the installation cost and um, so there's a cost um, that's paid and then the contractor might ask a percentage maybe a handling fee um, operation costs etc on top of that so the final cost is not known um, at the beginning of the project 
and then the managing co contract is usually um, someone is uh, appointed and then it um, the agreement is that um, the appointed manager or contract manager um, keeps the cost as low as possible okay so generally accepted uh, it is accepted that open tenders give the lowest prices while negotiated tenders usually has about five percent additional cost added to it uh, to the cost so conditions that will benefit the client or require higher standards of craftsmanship will necessarily increase the cost okay so um, there are always uh, risks involved uh, for all the parties so um, the next slide when we look at the, the um, time uh, ratio um, it will kind of explain on um, on the risks that can be identified earlier on uh, or later on it depending on the contract that you uh, uh, enter into so the risk um, risks has to be managed and minimized minimized then the type of contract selected usually determines who will be the most most risk um, and it um, the illustration will show that then the method selected must meet the client's needs okay um, as optimally as possible and because of the client uh, depend on the expert advice with regard to this matter so you will have to advise the client and then the client might be uh, well endowed and uh, will not mind taking high risk they just want the project done as quickly as possible and then here's the illustration that I spoke about. So um, it all boils down to the time that the client wants to spend on the project and the risk that the client is willing to take um, when um, evaluating this, um, the, these risks. So uh, you will see the information required at a tender, okay? And then the information required for, for control. So you've got your your minimum uh, and your maximum here so everything and your minimum so uh, you can see your client risks um, increase um, from uh, the the type of contract that he uses so you've got your client control that's available and then your client um, systems um, requirements so um, the more information quantities you've got available the lesser the cost would be and then um, if you lump sum contracts everything is included the client knows what's um, what he's going to get and as you move down with changes so if you've got a, a contract with bills of quantities it will um, and it might change so thus the risk for the client will also increase okay and then remeasurement contracts um, you, the client is not 100% sure of what the final cost would be because there's a certain amount of remeasurement of work that has to be and that has to take place and thus uh, the risk to the client will also um, increase and then the cost fixed amount um, is or oh, the cost plus amount obviously more risk than um, and cost uh, to the client incurs because of that and then a cost plus percentage uh, is where the client has the least um, control over the amount of money that's going to be spent and thus the risk to the client is much higher and then uh, control systems required so as uh, you um, progress on um, the less information during the design so if you go down to this side um, you will see that the um, emphasis on control increases as well so a very nice uh, illustration on how the risk to the client actually increases as um, as the information becomes less and obviously this is now dependent on the amount of time so the more time that the client um, needs to actually get the design done um, the lesser the risk and the um, quicker the uh, client wants to get into construction the higher the risk okay so in conclusion the client's budgets represents the time scale of uh, payments and availability of funds uh, to honor the contract certificates 
Okay, therefore the projected cash flow and uh, pre-contract design are very important and then the importance of documentation and coordination of project information must be uh, must not be underestimated uh, and its time effectiveness. Uh, management um, are essential uh, for the success of the project. Okay, so the management of the project is essential uh, for that and uh, thus as experience, uh, as you obtain experience, uh, you will be able to anticipate and ask the right questions uh, whenever you start out with your projects. A project, as I mentioned uh, in the first lecture, is um, it's all about getting the, the scope from the client, uh, which is very important. Okay, everyone, thank you. That is basically um, this lecture for today. Um, yeah, please make sure that you go through this and that you keep up to date uh, with your um, with the work that uh, you do not um, struggle in um, whenever you do get to a test or informal that you are up to date uh, and you can actually apply the information that we've gone through so far. Thanks. And also remember that you are welcome to contact me, send me an email or um, uh, give me a ring if, uh, if needed. But please communicate if there is any questions. Thank you, everyone.